So welcome everyone to the third Kelsey Museum virtual flash talk. For those of you new to this format, this a flash talk is a brief presentation about a current research project, uh, followed by a lengthy Q&A. Our presentation today should last about 15 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A with you, our audience. Uh, please use the Q&A feature or the chat feature to ask your questions. Um, I will read your, once uh, our presenters are done today, I will read the questions to them and we'll have a little conversation um, for, that, for that part of the presentation today. Uh, finally, as you have heard uh, from the disembodied voice, this event is being recorded today. Our speakers today are Suzanne Davis and Carrie Roberts. Carrie and Suzanne are the conservators at the Kelsey Museum, and today they're going to be speaking about their research on the painted uh, funerary uh, stele from the site of Terranuthis in Egypt. Welcome, Suzanne and Carrie. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I am going to share my screen um, if Kathy gives me access for that. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Okay, let me bring up um, the PowerPoint. Just toggling back and forth here through uh, Zoom and PowerPoint. Let's go here now. Okay, so I think you should be seeing the presentation now. Thank you so much for joining us on this Springtime Friday. My name is Suzanne, and thanks to Kathy for her introduction. I'm one of two conservators at the Kelsey, and I'll get us started before handing off to my colleague, Carrie. We'll be talking about a collection of highly decorated gravestones from a town called Terra Nuthis in Egypt. You see three of those grave markers here on the screen. So these are about 1700 years old, and they're made out of limestone, and they're painted. And to orient you a little bit to what they show, on each one you see a carved image of the deceased person. In the center, you see a whole family with two people on the left standing with their hands raised in prayer. And then you see two others reclining on a couch. So these are typical ways to show the person who died. And although it's hard to see, each of the gravestones here also shows a funeral banquet on a table in front of the deceased. These gravestones are usually inscribed with a person's name, their age at death, and then sometimes there's a message directed to the mourners. And one of my favorite messages is the title of this talk, it's Be of Good Cheer. So in other words, you know, don't be sad, your loved one might be gone, but they're okay. So in the Kelsey Museum, we have about 200 of these gravestones, which are also called funerary stele. They were excavated in 1935 by a team led by University of Michigan archaeologist Enoch Peterson, and they range in date from the 2nd to the 4th century CE, a time when Egypt was a colony of Rome. There was, of course, an ancient town at Terranuthis, but by 1935 it had been dug up to use the mud bricks as fertilizer for farming. So if you're familiar with the excavation of Karanis, Egypt, an archaeological project which was also led by University of Michigan in the 1920s, the opposite was true at the town of Karanis, which is the same date basically as Terranuthis. So the town survived there, but the cemetery was gone. So at the Kelsey Museum, the objects from Karanis and Terranuthis worked together to show us what life and death were like for regular people in Egypt at this time. So this Terranutha stele dates to the late second century CE and it shows a young man named Nemesion. He has curly black hair, reddish skin, plump cheeks, and he's wearing formal Roman clothes, in this case a toga. He holds his hands up in prayer and he's surrounded by an elaborate architectural frame with carved and painted columns. He's also flanked on both sides by jackals, animals sacred to Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of the dead. And what this tells us is that Terranuthis had a culturally diverse population. So clothing and furniture look Roman, the architectural motifs and inscriptions are Greek, religious iconography is strongly influenced by ancient Egyptian traditions, and individuals' names are Greek and Greek-Egyptian hybrids. Funerary stele like this one are important sources of archeological information. And when you see them in museums, they look like art objects. 
but of course they were made to be gravestones. And the inscription on this one tells us that Nemesion died at age 24 in the month of November. Here are a few views of the Terranutha Cemetery, which was filled with pyramid and barrel vaulted tombs, each with a niche where the stela would go, as you see it right. And then also take a moment to notice that the monuments themselves are plastered and painted. So unlike our cemeteries today, the Terranutha Cemetery was very colorful and decorative, and you could come and visit with your deceased loved one in a space that was a little bit like a chapel in the front of the monument. The stele have suffered damage over time, which is where, of course, conservation comes in, but these objects are favorites of most Kelsey Museum staff, and I think it's because they're so unique and they're so personal. You can really feel a connection with these people when you look at their faces and you read their names. And in my view, one of the best reasons to study the ancient world is for the perspective and understanding it can bring to your own life. And for me, during COVID, these ancient gravestones have been very comforting. In part, that's because they point out how universal and timeless the experience of grief is. I look at these and I think not only about the person who died, but also the people who were left to carry on. And I want to read you a few of the inscriptions. Asglas, who died before his time, devoted to his father, aged three. Tibelis, about 30 years old, be of good cheer. Artemis, son of Corios, who is without grief, was worthy and devoted to his wife, children, and friends. Farewell, aged 49. Achilleus, daughter of Ptolemaios, who has died before her time, 82 years old, worthy, noble, a cheerful person, having departed life in good fortune. So many of us have lost loved ones over the past year. And I think these phrases, even though they're formulaic, still have emotional resonance for us today. I could tell you exactly what I'd write for some of the people I've lost over the past year. And I am sure that you could do the same. But what I really want to challenge you to think about today is what you would want your own stela to say. How would you like to be remembered? As we study and work and try to keep pace with the world today, it's so easy to let our lives become misaligned from what we truly value and how we actually want to spend our time. And as we continue to talk about these objects, I invite you to keep this idea, the idea of what you'd want your stela to say and how you'd want it to look in the back of your mind. And if you feel like sharing anything about that through the Q&A feature, please do. And if not, maybe just give this question some thought over the next few days, because it might inspire you to make a few changes or to try something new going forward. From 1935 to the present day, Kelsey Museum directors, staff, and students have concerned themselves with preservation of the Terra Nusis Dealey. From the time they were dug out of the ground to today, so they were also the subject of the first Kelsey Museum Studies volume. And this is a series, an academic series that continues to be published today by the University of Michigan Press. So this very first volume was authored by Finley Hooper who made the Steely the subject of his PhD dissertation at Michigan. In the past 10 years, there's been a concerted effort funded in part by the Samuel H. Kress Foundation to address some of the physical problems suffered by these objects. This has included conservation to remove salts and address damage, including cracking and flaky powdery surfaces. And then more recently, my colleague Carrie has been conducting research on the pigments used to decorate this steely. And I'm going to turn this presentation over to her now to tell you about this work. So Carrie. Can you advance the slide, Suzanne? Yeah. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a, of a Zoom difficulty here. All right, here we go. Thanks, Suzanne. So as Suzanne just illustrated so nicely, um, 
These grave markers have been a source of inspiration and contemplation for both of us during the pandemic. And uh, I'm particularly fascinated by their color um, or their polychromy. The fact that so much of it remains after 2000 years is incredible to me. Um, and more than that, there isn't that much research out there about color in Roman Egypt. So a lot of what we're learning about them in regards to color is new. Uh, the Steely's colors reveal a lot about how the people of Terranuthis felt about death, but they also paint a picture of what life is like for people, uh, for normal people living in Roman Egypt. I began my research by recording what colors I saw on the Steely, and then after that, I looked for trends and patterns in how specific colors are used on the steely. And finally, I selected a group of about 50 steely for multispectral imaging. Multispectral imaging is a photographic technique that can be used to identify pigments on objects. Pigments respond in characteristic ways to different wavelengths of light, including visible, ultraviolet, and infrared light. We use different light sources and camera lens filters to produce and record these characteristic responses. So on the stela of Tacitarion here, we were able to detect rose matter in Egyptian blue. Now, if you look at the image at center, the rose matter shows up as a bright pinkish orange color. You can see it on Tacitarion's garment and on the column capitals to either side of her. In the image on the right, you can see Egyptian blue in the bright white glowing areas of infrared luminescence. So in the couch cushion she's sitting on, in the vessel she's holding in her hand, and in a couple of the objects in the banquet scene below her Klein couch. We know that Egyptian blue was widely produced in the third to fourth centuries but it seems to have been used very selectively on these gravestones. So it may have been rather expensive for regular people. And this is just one example of what the pigments can themselves can tell us about what life was like at turn in this. We've also seen that people prefer particular colors uh, for certain features and use those colors frequently. For example, Red is commonly used on architectural frames in both the steely and on the tombs painted facades in the cemetery. This might be related to the color symbolic meaning in Egyptian art and language. Red carries both positive and negative meanings, which seems fitting for a people who believed in an afterlife. An example of that would be that it, the color red represents both the sun and the god Seth who murdered Osiris. Uh, Osiris, the god of rebirth, wore a red burial shroud, and we find mummies and Roman Egyptian burials wrapped in this color. By examining color, we've also learned about what the people of Terranuthis wore, or at least about their formal clothing styles. We may very well be looking at depictions of people in their best getups and how they may have appeared in life. Women's tunics and mantles are often blue and pink, while men's clothing is usually not painted or white. This sort of gender distribution of color and clothing is similar to what we see on painted mummy portraits, um, an example of which you can see on the right in our collection. Um, and in these portraits, the majority of women appear in pink and purple garments, while men are shown generally wearing white. Some women on the steely were even dressed in purple, which was a very high status color for textiles. On the steely, this color was achieved by mixing the pigments matter pink and Egyptian blue. And as seen here, the two pigments are occurring in the same locations, suggesting that they were mixed together or maybe layered in order to create purple. For textiles, purple color could be achieved through various plant and animal-based dyes. The deepest, most famous, and highest status purple dye was made from shellfish. 
but many less expensive alternatives were available. We're seeing that the people of Terranuthis had access to a wide range of pigments and dyes, which may point to an expansion of materials and goods available under Roman rule, as compared to what was available previously to regular people. Color also reveals something new about the stele's imagery. If you look into this architectural facade on the stela on the left, you'll see that there are colorful backgrounds behind some individuals. On this stela of Sisis, aged 70, you can see a green and yellow background, which reminds me of wall paintings that have been found in Roman Egyptian tomb interiors, like the one on the right from Tuna el Jebel. So when we add color to the equation, the mostly flat stele open up into little rooms or tombs of sorts for the deceased person to recline in as they enjoy their afterlife. Finally, our research has led to some unexpected discoveries. On Stila 21021, the woman in purple, we found a painted inscription that was invisible until we examined the object under UV light. So you can see the visible light image on top and the UV image on the bottom. Although no longer visible to the naked eye, in fact, it had completely faded by the time Finley Hooper cataloged the stela in the early 60s. Something in the inscription is absorbing ultraviolet light, making it slightly darker than unpainted areas. IFCA student Caroline Nemechek translated the inscription. The beginning couldn't be recovered, but the rest reads, M Onamunis, aged about 19 years old. The Greek name Amunis is a, god, is a nod to the Egyptian god Amun and was a pretty common name in Roman Egypt. A lot of names like this one ended in Amunis too, like Aramunis, Ariamunis, and many more. So although we're not completely sure what this woman's name is, we know more about her identity now than before we started this research. What this also suggests is that many of the stele that don't appear to have inscriptions might originally have had painted inscriptions uh, that are now faded and no longer visible. Now, although scholars have speculated about this, this is the first time one has actually been seen to my knowledge. So this work is ongoing. Suzanne and I were thrilled to receive a grant from the National Endowment of the Humanities last winter um, this grant is uh, going to allow us to study color on artifacts from both Terranuthis and Quranis. And by exploring color on stone, ceramics, textiles, and other materials from these sites, we hope to learn even more about what the world looked like for folks living in Roman Egypt almost 2,000 years ago. Thank you. All right, thank you both so much. We uh, have one question in the chat so far and I invite everyone else to, uh, to ask your questions as we move forward. So the question is, thank you for this interesting presentation. Does Kel the Kelsey Museum have any other elements of this interesting cemetery, uh, such as funerary goods, mummies, et cetera? Also, I feel curious about the museum display of these lovely tombstones. Are they on display and in what theme? Yeah. yeah, I don't know who wants to start with that. Um, we, you know, we do have other elements. I, I'll let Carrie talk about the tomb elements, but we have, we have some items from the burials. So we have um, jewelry and other things. We don't, to my knowledge, have any human remains from the site of Terranuthis, um, but but we do, we do have things that were buried with some of the people in the Kelsey Museum. Not many, honestly, um, but, but some. And then Carrie, if you wanna talk a little bit more about the, about the monuments. Sure, we, we have um, quite a few wall painting fragments from the tombs themselves. So um, a layer of plaster with paint over, over the top. Um, most of them come from I think two or three specific tombs from the site. And um, I'm trying to think what else we might have. We also have a really wonderful collection of archival photographs of the site that show, and then Suzanne showed some of them, um, that show exactly where some of the stele were discovered and some of the tombs were discovered. So um, 
that's given us a really good idea of um, what the cemetery looked like and how how these grave markers were positioned and would have been approached in the cemetery. Um, yeah, I think that's the extent of what we have. And then yeah. they are displayed actually at the museum. So not we have several that are on display and in the same case with them, um, you know, when it's not COVID and it's okay to touch things, you can pull out drawers beneath the exhibition case and you can see other other smaller items from the cemetery. So yeah, so if you're in Ann Arbor and you're able to visit, you know, please come. Thank you both. Um, the next question is, were the jackals at uh, that time domesticated dogs or wolves? Um, so our resident jackal expert is Terry Wilfong, who I, I think is not on the call today. But, um, you know, jackals now are sort of like, uh, uh, like feral dogs, you know, they're, they're sort of like something between, um, between domesticated dogs and, and wolves. <laughs> they're, they're definitely not wolves. <laughs> I'm not a, um, you know, zoologist, so I'm like, my jackal knowledge is maybe a bit slim, but mm, that's my best, my best dab at that answer. Thank yeah, you. I'm not, not going to follow on that. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. All right. Well, does anybody else have any other questions? I have I, one. You guys are. Um, I was curious, Carrie, and maybe I missed it, but did you say, have you been able to identify what the, they were using for red pigment on the tombstones? Um, not yet. We have a new piece of analytical equipment that we'll be able to use to start to answer that question. Um, I think in most cases, the red is likely an earth pigment, like a red ochre, um, maybe hematite. Uh, but we'll need to confirm that. There may be a few steely though, where a different kind of red pigment was used. Um, at the time, there were uh, other types of red such as cinnabar and vermilion, cinnabar vermilion that were used, as well as a lead-based red pigment. Um, and that particular one's been found on other Roman Egyptian objects. So I'm kind of hopeful that we'll find more than one type of red, uh, especially since those kind of more toxic reds may have come from somewhere else. And that tells us potentially something about how pigments were traveling through throughout the Roman Empire at the time. All right, thank you. And um, someone has just uh, dropped into the chat in case uh, people are interested in uh, this question about the jackals, a link to the Kelsey Museum's uh, exhibition on the jackal gods of ancient Egypt called Death Dogs. Um, yes, absolutely check out that website. It is a great one. Yeah, it's really good. And I think you can also download the catalog for that show for free from our website. So mm -hmm. that's pretty fun too. Um, yeah. And I don't know, Kathy, if you want to MC, I see we have a couple other questions. Um, oh, yes, sorry, he's looking at yeah. the wrong thing. Here we go. Here's the next <laughs> We have three more here. So great presentation. Thanks. I would be interested and possibly sad to compare the state of the poly polychromy of the wall paintings and the decorations seen in your archival photos. So I don't know if you guys want to comment on if you if you see any degradation or. The wall painting fragments have held up really well um, from what I've observed. It's really the steely themselves that have suffered. And I have been able to compare one really well with its original archival photograph, like from its discovery. And there's definitely been a loss of some of, some of the material. And um, if you actually look at some of the steely up close, you can see there, it's very unlikely on a few of them that the polychromy would have survived the type of deterioration that's happened. The, powdery of, the powdering of the stone just pushes everything off the surface. So, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Thank you. I wanted to say to um, Tony, who asked that question, the cemetery is gone. So the Kelsey's excavation was really like a salvage project. It was 
the site um, was being dug by um, fertilizer diggers, you know, to take the mud bricks to use in farming. And that was like most of the cemetery had already been destroyed by that. And then it was also right next to this like salt mining operation. So it was really under a threat. And, um, and the, the Kelsey just had this one really brief sort of salvage season there. And then uh, it's not there anymore. So uh, that might, you know, like there's not stuff still on site to my knowledge that, that, that we could look at. Um, we have another one. So thank you for the wonderful presentation and necessary job on those steely. Uh, do you plan on any scientific edition of the steely? Um, this would be very useful. I lead the current French expedition at Terra Nuthis and would very much be interested in seeing their reassessment. So I don't know if you guys have plans for publication or not. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> Maybe more than one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how much data we get. Yeah. yeah, and we had another comment about an exhibition of the Steely and we do wanna do that too. Like that's really high on our list. We'd like to do an exhibition and a catalog with the scientific information that some of our recent research. Yeah, yeah. So that was our next question is, is there going to be yeah. a special exhibition? Yeah. Excellent. And, and then we have one more from, from Tony. Uh, can you talk about the desalination and consolidation of the stone shown earlier? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we... Um, there have been a few, a few of the steely have been desalinated. Um, we, back in the 1980s, a conservator um, was able to use a water bath to pull salts out of the stone. We took a different approach. We used a paper pulp, um, Arbacel BC-1000 <laughs> paper pulp, um, soaked in deionized water. And we, I think we applied maybe two, two applications and then measured the salt content of the pulp. So that, it was pretty successful. Um, but we've done a lot of other things. We've used um, calosil nanolime as a consolidant. We were really worried about using like a polymer-based adhesive on the surfaces of these objects. Um, there was a historic treatment using duco cement. We don't know at what point it was applied, but it was after, maybe not long after excavation. And that's starting to peel off. And you can actually see that layer taking bits of the stone off with it. So we wanted to use something uh, more chemically compatible with the limestone. And we're currently assessing you know, if that's working over the long term or not. But that we've had some success with that material. And, and because I know that Tony is a conservator, I will also say that we did publish that project uh, in JAIC. So I think, I think it came out last year. Yeah. All right. Thank you both so much. Um, that concludes our flash talk today and uh, thank you all for coming and I encourage you to attend our next flash talk which will be next month I believe it's May 5th um, and that will be uh, with uh, the Kelsey Museum director Nick Terranato. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks for Thanks, coming. Everybody.